if you want to find out more about the church, you can see there's blocks to check off, places to write in. You can put your name, contact information in there. But whatever you need, please put it on there. And then on your way out, get, give it to one of the ushers or put it in one of the white buckets, and we'll get it to where it needs to go. Because what you desire, what you want, we want to help to fulfill and answer. So I'll give you the opportunity to, to fill that out and turn that in. But thank you for being here with us. Also, I want to point out, Tuesday night, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock is our prayer night. A time that we come together in the evening to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through prayer. We come together to sit with each other in the Holy Spirit to lift up this church, to lift up our loved ones, to lift up the community, the, the nation, and the world in prayer. So I invite you to be part of that. And, you know, if you can't make it at 6, that's fine. Sometime during 6 and 7, though, I encourage you to come out and just pray with us and, and, and just, just seek our Heavenly Father. So from 6 to 7 on Tuesday night, you're invited to attend. And also, lastly, I want to say thank you. Because I, as I pointed out this morning, that our LPs team is now armed and dangerous and ready to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ in that country. And that's great, because you guys are part of that. You, we are the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We are the body. And we come together in whatever way, be it in traveling, be it in financial support, be it in prayer, to make sure what God's desire is in Ethiopia comes true, comes to fruition, and it happens. And because you guys are willing and graceful to give of what God has given to you, they've met all the financial needs that they need. They will be able to buy the motorcycle. They will be able to support the pastors. And they will be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that message can continue on and on and on. And I thank you. We thank you. you know, we thank each other for being part of that and, and being able to be part of such an amazing mission. So thank you so much. You know, um, there's an expression, you may have heard it before. It's in movies a lot. I'm surprised Hollywood uses it. But, you know, when someone is stressed trying to come up with an answer to, to gain insight, they ask for the wisdom of Solomon. Have you ever heard that expression? Lord, grant me the wisdom of Solomon to make this decision. And in the Bible, we have the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon was the son of David. David was the guy that killed Goliath, became king of Israel. Solomon is his son. And Solomon, when given the opportunity to, to ask God for whatever he wanted, whatever he could have, he prayed for wisdom. And God granted him that wisdom. Solomon didn't keep it to himself. He shared it with us. He shared his wisdom through the Bible, what God imparted onto him so that we can use it. So I want to just share something out of the book of Proverbs. And it's, it's Proverbs 30, verse 8. And it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Solomon's wisdom. I want just enough, but not too much. Solomon's wisdom is he understands that if we don't, or we're not careful, that money can separate us from God. Whether we have an abundance of it, or we don't believe we have enough of it, it makes no difference. If we rely on money, we will never be satisfied. Money has the ability to separate us and break down our relationship for God. So we need to pray to God to give us just enough. Give us our, day, our daily bread, is what Jesus said. And when we do that, God provides to meet our needs. But we've got to be careful to not to look at the money as our God, but to look at God for who he is, the provider of our needs. Money has a way of separating us in our relationship to God. So as, as uh, we look at giving an offering, it's an ability, it's an opportunity just to say thank you 
and show our obedience to God, to show our dependence on God for what he has given each and every one of us. That's what an offering is. An offering is an ability for us to say, thank you, God, for providing for our needs. And it's a way of saying, thank you, God, for allowing me to depend on you to meet those needs. When we give, we are declaring our dependence on God. We are declaring that God is in control and God is more important than our money. That's what offering is about. And then we pray that God uses this to further the name of Jesus Christ wherever he chooses. It's his decision. We provide and he's The ushers come forward to take part, be part of giving. So that, and in saying, God, thank you for what you have given us. And God, I am dependent on you to meet our needs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who we praise, who we worship. We say thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our Savior for doing for us what we never could do. And God, we thank you for all the provisions in our lives that you need. And we say, God, thank you for that. And use what we give back to you to further this name, to further the name of Jesus Christ and what he has done to those who have not yet heard. So God, however you choose to use this offering, we know it'll be to glorify your name. And we thank you for allowing us to just to be part of that. God, as, you, as these families go through this week, may your love, your grace, your mercy, your blessing just flow through their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. want me to oh yeah if you could find the road that gets us back to the freeway thanks but I could oh no I got this where are we for 
Perhaps you need a little help from above. That's it. GPS. Are you sure you don't want me to... Nah, I got this. You are not on any known road. Please return to the nearest roadway. I'm not doing so good, am I? Would you like to drive for a while? Would you like to drive from now on? I'd love to. mean to it was an accident i'm publicly confessing my sin so uh we we're in a mess though in our world aren't we i just saw on my phone i get uh, bulletins when uh, two people were shot in some florida hospital somewhere where was it anybody know titusville uh we just saw the horrible horrible terrorist attack in france in, in uh, nice france um I mean, it's just, remember what I said last week about when we ended the service that something's going to happen and not just something, but many things have happened. And it's caused some deep unrest. It's caused some real pain and some hurt in the lives of people. And, and we ask ourselves the question, you know, what do we do about this? You know, we, we have leaders who are very smart people, intelligent people, and they're trying to figure out how do we stop terrorists? How do we... Uh, you know, ease racial tensions? How do we, you know, fix our economy, which we're in bad shape? How do we fix all of these things? It's, there's kind of wars within wars, isn't there? In fact, this year, 2016, we've decided to say this is a year of spiritual warfare because we know that the real war comes, comes from a different place than what we think. It's not about tanks and planes. It's about something much more, uh, much more uh, uh, insidious. Um, and we have kind of claimed Ephesians six twelve, which simply says this: For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the of this dark world, and against spiritual forces in in the heavenly realms. And and the truth of the matter is. Satan is alive and well. In fact, he is the supreme terrorist. He is the giant jihadist. He is, he is seeking whom? He's lurking about, the scripture says. He's, he's lurking in your homes. He's lurking in our community. He's out in our world. And he and his demonic forces, the Bible tells us basically this, he is seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. But today, I want to talk about a different kind of war. A war, that, a war that rages deep within our hearts, deep within our souls. It's, it is a holy war of sorts. It's a war that we fight with ourselves. Have you ever said, heard this before, that I'm my own worst enemy? Sometimes the pull of sin and the pull of selfishness is just there. You see, listen to me, hear my heart. We don't have a skin problem. We have a sin problem. I know you've heard that before. Because when every evil comes from sin, all sin derives from selfishness. 
And if we could allow God to win that war in our lives, there would be peace, not only in our, in our church, not only in our community, not only in our families, but in our world. If we would learn that the real battle that we have is really not external. I mean, it, it, it surfaces that way, but it's internal. What would happen in your life if God won the internal battle? You see, when self wins, we lose. How many remember the legend of Narcissus? Have you ever heard that? The legend of Narcissus, he was, he, he was uh, wrapped up in himself. That's where we get the term. And he was looking into a, a, a pool, uh, some water, a pool of water, when the water was still, he saw his reflection and he fell helplessly in love with himself. And when he went to embrace himself, the water, of course, rippled and he couldn't see himself anymore. And he, and he died, legend has it, he died staring at what he couldn't get, which was himself. And I would... I would in, encourage you today to look at what I'm talking about. If God can change us internally, if God can have the right to work in and through us and change self, what would happen in our church and in our lives? I'm, have you ever heard people say, I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't care what anybody thinks? Have you ever said, I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm tired of listening to this person. I'm tired of listening to that person. I'm, trying, I'm tired of trying to please everybody. In fact, you will never please everybody. So I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't care what anybody else thinks. And the truth of the matter is you shouldn't live for what other people think. But you do need to worry about what God thinks. We need to live for an audience of one, not ourselves. Have you heard people say this? You need to follow your heart. Well, that's dangerous. Ever believe in yourself? That's dangerous, folks. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful. It's wicked. Who can know it? And God knows that, and so he says, I am going to take over. If you'll let me, I'll take over your life. I will invade your soul. Excuse me, soul. I will, I, will, I will embrace who you are. I will take over the deed of your heart and your lives. And when I do, and you give up yourself, and I do, I will give you peace. How many here could use some peace? How many here could use some uh, contentment? You know, how many here could use some joy? I mean, real joy in your life? You know? I mean, I know, I mean, I can tell. We live in a time of extreme unrest. And that has trickled down to people in these small communities who is wondering, when's the next attack coming? And folks, I'm telling you, the only way that we're going to have peace and joy and contentment is when we give up and give over our lives to Jesus Christ. You see, when we do what we want to do, we end up going where we don't want to be. When we say, I'm going to live my life for me, I'm going to live my life for my desires, my pleasures, my wants, you know, we're never going to, we're going to end up in a place we said, how did I get here? Um, and I want you to know that this is, it's tough. It's difficult. This fight with ourselves, this war within is difficult. James tells us this in James 1.15. He says, when lust is conceived, I'm, I'm using a different version than you're reading up there. When lust is conceived, or the, the, the NIV puts it this way, 
Then after desire has conceived, same thing, it gives birth to sin. Would you read this last part with me? And sin, when it is, gives birth to death. Let me ask you this, and you can answer this in your heart. What in your life has died because sin, because sin became full grown there? Was it a marriage? Was it a relationship with your children? Is it your finances? What is it that desire took over? What I want to do took over. What I thought was best took over without any connection with God, without any uh, asking for God's wisdom and direction. What's died in your life? You know, Paul struggled with this <laughs> big time. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, listen to what Paul says. He says this. I do not understand what I do. You ever said that? I don't, what am I doing? In, in our vernacular, our terms, what am I doing? You ever said that? Or what is happening, you know? <laughs> For what I... Go on, slow look. I get con- this is kind of confusing. Okay, I agree that the law is good, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Verse seventeen, he says, "As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is who living in me." Then he goes on to say this. He says, "For I know that good itself does not dwell in me; that is in my sinful nature." For I have the desire, uh, read this last part with me. This is really, see if you can relate, okay? Here we go. Great, I know this is not an enthusiastic verse, but help me out. Okay, here we go. For I have the desire to do what is good, but but I can't carry it out. He keeps talking. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. Here we go together. This I keep on doing. Anybody like that? Maybe with an addiction or an obsession? I don't know. Here we go. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. Doesn't he sound, you know, kind of confused? (laughs) Okay. He says, but it is sin living in me that does it. So if I so I find this law at work, although I want to do good, here we go. Come on, this is true. Evil is right there with me. Verse twenty-two. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Don't you? Don't you delight in God's law? But I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. He gets really frustrated here. Would you read this first part with me? This is fun. Okay, here we go. What a wretched man I am. (laughs) Or you could say woman, okay, if you're a woman. Okay, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And he goes on to say, it is Jesus Christ. Who is the answer? But even the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest uh, 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 Bible teachers, greatest apostles, in fact, he wrote much of the New Testament, says what we often say. I don't know if I can do this. My flesh and my spirit seem to be at a constant at odds with each other. I fight this. And somehow I know intuitively this about you and about me. I know this is about me, but this is a constant battle in my life. It's a constant, you know, conflict within me. And folks, listen, if we can get this conflict resolved, 
on a continual basis, we can experience something that many of us are seeking for, are longing for, are hoping for, even while we're on this planet. We can begin to experience peace and contentment and real joy. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I know the hurt and the problems that that self produce when we do things the way we want to do them, when we just simply do what we want to do. How many have ever read the book of Judges in the Old Testament? You ever read that? That's a tough book. You read a whole lot. There's some things in there I've, I've, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about. But you know what the final verse of the book of Judges it says? Every man, and this is the different versions say close to the same thing. Every man or everyone did what was right in their own eyes. If you want to know what happens when we just kind of let what we want to do happen, just kind of read the book of Judges. It, it, it'll help you with that. Even Jesus dealt with this. He dealt with this thing. In fact, he had two of his followers. And, 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 and in, uh, in Luke chapter 9, verse 46, he says, I'm just going to read this to you. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the... <laughs> okay, Lord, you know, I know you're at the right hand of the Father, but could I be on the left? <laughs> you know, I know that you're going to be the king, but could I be, you know, like kind of right next to you? Because I'm a pretty smart dude. I, I'm a pretty wise guy. I could pretty well, you know, help you out. Sometimes we, we view and we attack God. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child. Isn't that amazing? Takes a little child and, and, and had him stand beside him. Then he said, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least. Read this with me. Here we go. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Now, there's a whole message on that, and I'm not going to get into that today, but any more than this. God wants to take you and, and say, you step aside and let me run your life. That's what God wants to do. James begins to talk about it. James brings it up. In fact, if you read the book of James, let me tell you a little bit about who he's writing to. He's writing to these scattered believers, these scattered Jews from the first church, and many of them have been persecuted. But let me tell you what happens when difficult times come, and it lasts for an extended period of time. We get impatient. We get bitter. We get selfish. You know, why are they allowed to do this and I'm not allowed to do this? Why can they do this and I can't do this? What, what, what is, you know, and then we begin this kind of sermon that we preach all the time. What about me? Why am I not being put in a better position here? And so some of these scattered believers are struggling. They've been persecuted for the cause. Jesus to basically the truths of his spirit to depart from who from them and they're kind of trying to handle all this by themselves. And so James, you know, what you find out about James is that, you know, he kind of doesn't cut any corners. He doesn't candy coat anything. He doesn't, you know, water anything down. He pretty much says truth. He kind of throws truth out there. And you know he does it with love. So in chapter 5, about this inner war that we have, this war within this war that if we will get this, listen to me, please. If we will allow God to win, we'll change everything. It will not only change our situation, but it will, it will kind of trickle down. It will kind of infect everyone else around us. It's an amazing thing. So here's what James says. James chapter 4, starting with verse 1. I love this kind of teaching, okay? So stay with me. We're going we're gonna to learn some things, I think, that will help us win the war. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle, what? Within you. He's asked this kind of rhetorical question. All the 
fights and the quarrels and the tension and the unrest and all the things that are going on. He's saying, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? By the way, let me, let me say this. When you became a follower of Jesus, I don't care who you are, I don't care what country you live in, I don't care what, it doesn't matter. You signed over the deed of your life, in essence. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, that, that we have been bought by God. Isn't that good news? That we were on our way to destruction, to hell. But we were purchased through Jesus Christ, the blood on the cross. He bought us. Now, He owns this body. He owns the soul. He owns the spirit. He owns all of us. Stay with me. And, and He holds the deed to our desires. Let me remember this. Not only did God, did, did Christ purchase through His blood your body, your soul, your spirit, your thoughts, your relationships, your finances, your children, anything that we call our own, that we want to, that we want to wrap our arms around, he owns. I mean, it's already been, you said, but I have my retirement. No, you don't. God owns it. If you're a follower of Christ, he owns it. And so he's trying to get these believers, James is trying to get these believers to kind of remember what's going on here. Here's what he says. He says, you desire, but you do not have. So you what? So you kill. And then he goes on and he says, you covet, you, do, you envy or you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you what? Help me. Quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask, but, basically he's saying, there's no but there, but he says, when you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong, you tell me. You're asking what? You're asking to get for yourself. He says that you may spend, that word spend is interesting, it's, it's actually the word squander. It can be translated squander. He says, you squander what you get on your, on your, on my, on pleasures. And then he, it's almost like he's getting frustrated while he's writing. Have you ever written a letter and you're just kind of upset and you're irritable and you write harder and it hurts your hand, you know? You, or you guys don't do that anymore. You don't. Maybe you beat up keys on, the, on your computer, I don't know, or on your phone. You're going, I'm going to show you. And their hand, you know, you, you know. I think James is saying it here. You adulterous people. And here's what he's saying. You people are unfaithful. I own, There was a marriage that took place between God and me. And God became, we and God became one. And he owns us. Then he says, <laughs> then he says, don't you know, get this. Would you read this with me? Because this is really important to grasp here we go don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with god that you're an enemy of god so he goes on and says here we go come on therefore anyone who chooses to be a f becomes wow that's pretty that's pretty cut and dry isn't it here's what he's saying if your affections are more for this world or for this world, you're not for me. Here's what he said. If you're not a believer, this doesn't apply to you because it doesn't matter to you. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you say, I believe Jesus Christ, I want to follow Jesus Christ, you he, Jesus, uh, James is saying, you got to make a choice. Because if you're not with him, you're against him. You can't straddle the fence. <laughs> then he goes on. This is an interesting verse some people miss. He says, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he, speaking of God, jealously longs for the smallest here, spirit that, has, that he has caused to dwell in us? Okay? Let me talk about that for just a second. 
Did you know that God is a jealous God? Have you ever heard that before? Now, when jealousy comes out of insecurity, it can be dangerous. There, you know, just like we talk about there's healthy fear, there's unhealthy fear. There, there's a certain amount of healthy jealousy that God has. Here's what that verse is basically saying. That God who created your spirit, and when you receive Christ, his spirit, capital S, became owner and resident of small s, your spirit. And here's what he basically says in that verse, is that, that, that God is jealous for your spirit. Now, there is healthy jealousy. Uh, let me give you an example. Now, this would never, I got to say this about 50 times, but you'll get the point. This would never, ever, 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 ever happen. I know it would. But pretend my wife came to me and said, Steve, there's a guy I met down the road, and he wants to take me out. He wants to take me to the Cracker Barrel. You know? <laughs> You know, for she, she would never do that, but let's pretend she did, okay? What do you think I'd say? Have fun? No. I'd say, no. And again, my wife, wouldn't. she, she, would, she would never do this. I have to say that 50,000 times so you understand. But, but to understand, my jealousy would arise. I would say, you can't go, you know why? And she might look at me with a puzzled look. No, she wouldn't. Why? I would say, I would say, because when we got married some 40 years ago, you're the only one that can be my date. We can date, but only each other. Do you want to go to Cracker Barrel Friday? I'll take you. You can't go with anyone else. Mercy says, if I've committed a crime and I stand before the judge and I deserve to be thrown. Is. 
God opposes the who? You know what pride is, right? Pride is self-deification. In other words, pride says that I make myself God. I can do what I want to do. I don't care what God thinks. I don't care who it hurts. That's pride. He says God opposes that. But shows, would you read this with me? Shows favor to the humble. And some text says gives grace. Use that term grace again. To the humble. What is humility? I simply come before God and say, it doesn't mean I beat myself up. It means that I give myself up to Him. I don't try to present another way. I don't try to get out of it. I simply do it. That's what the word submit means there. He means, he says, I sub- submit yourselves then to God. And then he says, read this next part with me. Resist and. Okay, that word resist is an interesting word too. Because it means, it, li- it means to stand against. It doesn't mean like. You know, somebody's pulling, you're just resisting. It means that I say, when Satan comes at me, I can't beat him. Near to, are you spending time with him? If I go to my wife and I say, Robin, I want to I want to get close to you, but I never come home. They're just empty words. The way that I that way the, the way that I and I know God's not a person that we touch, but you know something? God has made a way where we can spend, where we can carve out time every listen, every day. And let me make you, that verse is so true. The closer I get to him, 
the closer he gets to me. And he, you feel that anyway. And then he talks about some things that we need to get out of our lives. These next few verses. I love this. He says this. He says, he says wash your hands, you sinner. Um, And then he says this. And purify your hearts. What did he say after that? You what? Okay, here's the truth. Here's what we know to get. When our hearts are unclean, and we've got sin that's, that's lodged in our hearts and in our lives, that we can't get, we live like we're double-minded. In other words, we're unstable. We don't know which direction to go. The people who are confused and they don't know where to go. I don't, that doesn't mean we do have confusion and issues. And we don't know which way to go. We are double-minded. We say one thing and do another. And the way that we deal with double-mindedness, James says, is to purify our hearts. Wash our hands and allow God to clean out whatever it is that's polluting our heart. And then he goes on to say, I need to hurry. And, and, and don't misunderstand this understand this one. Grieve and, and, and grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, what, let me tell you what he's saying. A lot of times, here's what I think anyway. A lot of times when we come before God and we say, Oh God, forgive me of this sin and 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 change my heart and and I do whatever you say and I'll I'll follow you, we turn around and say, Okay, it's over. And, and it's no big deal. You know, sometimes when sin enters our lives and we let it stay there, sometimes we need to cry over it. We need to mourn. We need to say, this is not okay. And I let it in my life. It hurt people around me. I, it, 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 it's hurt, it hurt me. And sometimes we need to cry all night all about, about it. Now, I know we don't need to stay grieving. But there needs to be that grieving process as we allow God to remove the sin from our hands and from our hearts. And I love this next part. Because this is the, you know how all of this seems kind of negative? Here's the positive. Here you go. Would you read this with me? Humble yourselves before the Lord and He, He will, you're going to sing it, aren't you, Jim? Okay, okay. He will lift you up. And if you feel down and you feel out of it, here's what he says. If you will stand before me, surrender your life to me, do what I tell you to do, get the, get the impurities, you know, put, put them out of your life, begin to put them out there, let the spiritual spotlight get on them, get rid of them, remove them when they're deeply lodged in our hearts, stand before God that he says when you humble yourselves, in fact, he'll do most of that work. You don't have to do it. He says, I will lift you up. I would much rather be lifted up by Jesus Christ than by the world. I guarantee you that because they're lift, now they'll lift you up one day and they'll throw you down the next. God says, you humble, come before me and, and just surrender. Humble your heart before me, and I'll lift you up. And he goes on to say about a problem that pride produces. He says, he says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister 
or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you, when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. And then he goes on to say, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you who are, excuse me, but you who are you, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Here's what it's basically saying. When pride is in our heart, and we're kind of doing our own thing. We have a tendency to pass judgment. Now, now don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. If you see a brother or sister in Christ who's doing something that's wrong, that's de- that's, that could be destructive in their lives, and you say, well, I'm not going to judge, that's totally inappropriate. You need to go to that person. Scripture's clear about this. And you just say, you know, I don't have my life all together, but I see this happening in your life. And maybe you've been through it before and you know the disastrous results or, or whatever. You go to that person and you say, you know, this is not right in your life. That's not being judgmental. That's being Christ-like. But then there are those people who have pulled away from God and, and they judge everything. They judge people's hearts. They judge, they, they're critical and they're bitter. And here's what James is saying. When we are critical and bitter and judgmental with a judgmental attitude towards other people, how many know Christians that do that? Okay. When, when they're judgmental towards, he says, you're judging the law. Hey, do we have a right to judge the law? Judge God's word? No, we don't judge God's word. We, we obey God's word. There's, and he goes on to say in that text, he says, there is, a, there is a judge and a lawgiver, and we are sub- basically submitted to him. So our actions, see, when we, when we go and we start, listen, when, here's what we do. Whenever there's stuff going on in our lives, we have a tendency to attack others because it seems to cover up the hurt in our lives. Let me put it this way. When we begin to constantly judge everybody else, we fail to judge ourselves. You know, in Matthew, where it says, you know, instead of looking at the speck in a person's eye, you know, pay attention to the log that's, you know, that's coming out of your face, you know. And so James says, you know, you scattered believers, know it's tough, know it's difficult, but you can have a peace. You can have a joy. You can have God himself lift you up if you come to him with humility. And here's the bottom line with all this. And I have a bottom line. I bet I didn't even share it last time. Let me share it with you now. Here it is. Don't be a defender of yourself before God, but surrender yourself completely to God. Let me say it again. Don't be a defender of yourself before God. But In other words, don't try to defend all your actions before God, but surrender yourself completely to God. Now, it's all about surrender. It's all about saying, God, whatever you want, I want. It's all about allow, being humble before God and because God opposes the proud, the, the James tells us, and he gives grace or gives favor to the humble. When it's all about ourselves, all we have is a war. And I don't know about you, but I fight all the time. Okay, can I talk with you for just a minute? I mean, the, the sermon's done kind of thing. Don't leave yet. Okay. Um, I just want to talk with you just heart to heart. I mean, let's just kind of have a conversation, but I'll go first, okay? Yeah, thank you. Um, here's, here's what um, I got to share with you. Tonight of about 7.30, we're going to board a plane to Washington, D.C., and from, from Washington, D.C., we go uh, to Africa, to Addis Ababa. And I just, I just, you know, we say this, and I don't know why I say this. I want to be honest. I never want to be dishonest, so I, I don't know why I say that. I want, let me be frank with you. Let me just tell you how I feel. Um, this whole process of going over, over to Africa and all that is tough for me. And I'll tell you in just a minute. But let me say this before I say that. Let me say this. I love the United States of America. You know that? I love it with all my heart. I love this country. This is an amazing country. Um, in fact, if you've never been overseas, especially in a third world country, 
You don't understand how amazing this country is. You don't understand how good your life is in comparison. I, don't, I didn't understand that fully till I went. And I think we need to honor America. I think this is a great country. And, and um, in fact, we're going to put some flags up. We believe in this country. We believe in what America's, what God's doing here. And so, and so, just to be honest with you, but it is comfortable here. You know that? When I, we are sitting in air conditioning. It's wonderful. Can you imagine not? Can you imagine what it would be like in here with no AC? God's good. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable like you. And going to Ethiopia, I'm not a world traveler. I have no desire to be a world traveler. Okay. And I don't like the process of having to go to you. You know what I have to do? I have to stand up here and ask you for money to help us go over there. I hate that. you got to understand. If you know anything about me, Robin, I'm all right. I hate, I loathe saying, would you give us money so we could... You know, I mean, I understand, the, I understand that, that ministry is vitally important and we need to put our money there. But, you know, I know you guys work hard. I know that. I know some of you are struggling every week to make ends meet. Maybe because some bad choices you've made, or maybe maybe it's just tough. I know that. So it's it's that's that's a tough thing for me. Um, and then we're getting ready to go to Ethiopia, and we're going to fly. I hate airport securities where they molest you. You know, I I, I don't care about being violated, and and. And then, you, then we get on this plane for 15 hours. I hate that. You know, I would, if I could drive, I would drive. But that would be a horrible, horrible drive, I guess, over the water. But, um, and then we get there, and then we go into a country that is, there's nothing about Ethiopia that's, as far as the landscape, I mean, there's some neat things, but for the most part, it's not all that attractive. I love, love, love the people. Love the people. I have a shirt that says, I love Ethiopia. I heart Ethi Ethiopia. should say, I heart the Ethiopian people. I do. But you know, God has presented us a few years ago with this ministry that we can touch children's lives we can start a church and hopefully bring people who are who are in, in, in some already who have been part of Islam are finding Jesus folks I'm telling you when those kind of things happen I'm not looking forward to this flight over I promise you that or back it has a tendency, and please don't misunderstand me, because people from different nations have different hygiene things. There's, there's smells I don't like. Or hygiene practices. But, but folks, it's not about what I like. This church is not about me. It's not about what I think. It's about what he wants to do. And James was telling these scattered followers, it's not about you. It's all about me. You know, please don't take offense to what I'm about to say. You know, we have the, the movements of the Black Lives Matters, and some people say, well, no, we should say all lives matter. You know, let me tell you what's right. God matters. God matters. And when we learn that what He says matters and that we matter to Him, that changes everything. Can I tell you that every person who is upset and hurt, and maybe rightfully so, I'm against oppression, I'm against any person. Remember the, the song we used to sing as kids? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. When we get to the part where we say, 
God, you're all that matters. Then his love will so flow through us that everybody else will matter. And you will see people, you will never lock eyes with a person who doesn't matter to God. But sometimes we lose that because we get all about ourselves. And today, James has given us at least the beginning of remedying that awful disease of selfishness. And maybe you're here today. And you say, Pastor Steve, I don't know this God you're talking about. And I'm here to tell you that if you're feeling a tug at your heart, and you're feeling a pull and a drawing that you don't know what it is, I believe it's the Holy Spirit of God. And he's saying, here's what he's saying, don't misunderstand. Make me matter in your life. Make me matter. Give me your life. And when you do, folks, if you don't, I mean, you can sit there and say, I don't believe that old man... The old man's running his mouth again, and I don't want to hear it anymore. And that's fine. Go and do whatever you want to do. And God will be waiting. To some point, he won't. But it, he'll be waiting and pulling and tugging and saying, I, I can show you how to really live. And it's not by our ability. It's by my power and my might and my strength. So if you're here and you don't know him, you can come to know him right now. Would you bow your heads with me for just a minute? If you're here and you've never received Christ and you feel the pull of God on your heart, would you receive him right now? If You don't have to. Nobody's making you. There's no pressure here. It doesn't work, folks. But if God is, and you say, I need God, I've never trusted Christ, I've never received him, right now, with your head bowed and eyes closed, and this is you, if those that's not you, and you are a follower, just pray for those who need it. Just simply say this, if you've never received Christ, Father, come into my heart. Make me a new person inside. I'm, Father, I surrender myself. I've tried living my own way, and it just doesn't work. Today, I submit, I surrender myself to Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And I receive, and I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you just did that, and you want to take a next step and just just to understand what it means on your on your on our program we have a tear off slip and it says on the back it says today i received christ check that here's what i want you to do fill it out and check it and bill's in the back he's got a packet you just hand him that he won't talk to you he won't he won't corner you he won't put oil over your head or anything like that okay he'll just hand you that packet now, the packet's not all. It just gives you some resources and some information on what's the next step in your life. There's some next step, but I'm telling you, as we learn, here's what I want in my life, as we learn to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus Christ, we really begin to live. I've never, yeah, I've said this before, I've met a lot of people who have all kinds of regrets. Oh, Pastor Steve, I wish I wouldn't have done this, this, or that. I've never met a person who has fully surrendered themselves to Christ and said, you know, I did, I've fully surrendered my life to Christ all these years, and that was a dumb thing. Never met anybody, ever met anybody who said that. I've met people who played church, and I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about people who simply said, I am putting my finances, I am putting my relationships, I am putting my emotions, I am putting all of my, all of my eggs into his basket. I'm going to trust him all my life. And I've never met anybody who was sorry for that, ever. And if you're here today and you are a follower of Christ, you've already trusted Christ, but maybe as the war is raging inside, you're, you're, side, you're going the wrong direction. You're siding with yourself. <laughs> and today you need to be fully surrendered to him. And you just need to pray. You can pray with these folks. I guarantee they're safe people. They would love to.
pray with you. Maybe there's an issue in your life you'd like to pray with them for, or maybe you just want to come up here to this area and just pray by yourself. Nobody's going to bother you. I'm going to go wherever you're. I do this every week. I'm going to pray for you over here because I believe the Spirit of God is convicting some people that need to make a move. If you don't come, would you pray for those who do? Would you pray for maybe those who received Christ just now? Just use this time. Don't use this time to say, boy, when we hurry him, get out of here. You know, just use this time to seek God. So would you stand with me? And I'm going to pray. Father, do a work in your church in these next moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come as we sing?